introduction. Um, thank you, Becky, for asking me to be here, and thank you, Dr. Francis, for encouraging me and saying, of course, you should definitely do this. And that's the kind of um, connection that I found possible for me at Eastern as a, as a graduate of the OT program, and then a graduate again of the Master's in Public Administration program, is it's what I like about working here, actually, is that I feel that uh, faculty are approachable and they're open to mentoring and they want those questions like Dr. Francis is saying and um, I really uh, hope that you're all taking advantage of that because it just you could just keep cycling around and then all of a sudden an opportunity to speak or to take a student or something will come up and they'll think of you <laughs> and then maybe you'll be here <laughs> talking. Um, I also want to thank someone who is not in the audience, and his name is David Clifford, and he's um, a faculty member in the Health Administration Program, and um, he also is someone that I've gone to to consult with while I developed this. It's a huge wealth of knowledge related to um, ethics and healthcare. <laughs> um, so I come to you tonight with probably more questions than answers. Um, and I was nervous about that at first. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, no, that's the whole point of this, this lecture series, is that knowledge is um, not fixed, it's always developing. Um, and um, to me, as a healthcare practitioner, and as someone who works with students and places students in these settings, I feel that um, having asking a lot of questions and listening and, and fumbling about and not only always knowing the answers, um, looking for different ways of looking at a problem is that's reflective practice. And I see one of my colleagues, um, Jane, in the back, and, and she and I talk a lot about reflective practice. And uh, and I, I believe that reflective practice and reflection is a hallmark of, um, of professionalism, actually. And it's how we ensure that we stay ethical. Um, and that's regardless of discipline, whether you're in healthcare or some other field. Um, but specifically as a healthcare practitioner, I have a code of ethics, and you heard about that. Um, from if you were at the last lecture series, she was talking about the code of, uh, psychology code of ethics. And you did some casework around that. And I have a code of ethics as well. And, um, and it, it, I feel that it, it, when I became an OT, it was my, I agreed to that. I agreed to adopt that. I agreed in some ways to lose a piece of myself um, and to bring or to add, gain a piece of myself and, and to live not just in the clinic or when I'm working with the patient, but to live by those principles. And um, so I feel that I'm charged with remaining relevant and current in what's going on um, in my practice, in health care. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, has been really helpful for me to return to Eastern is to recognize that, that as a discipline, occupational therapy is growing and growing and growing. And there's new theories and new thinking out there. And what an amazing um, dialogue to be having and to constantly challenging myself. And so um, I guess what I'd like to say is that I hope that you stay connected to inquiry after this lectureship. Um, and that as you graduate and you move further away from your academic experience, uh, that you remember that it's important to reach back and to connect and to find out what's new in your discipline, to read other disciplines and to see what are they thinking about, um, to take a student, to come to a lecture, even if you don't get credit for it, you're not required to be there. To go to to join your professional organization and stay connected, because a lot of times they are um, publishing uh, some of the latest research that's going on. Um, whatever keeps you thinking and questioning, and so this notion of ethics in healthcare is a huge, huge, huge conversation. <laughs> There's no way 
we're going to figure this out today. Um, and we'll probably just barely scratch the surface, but my hope is that I give you um, some things to grapple with, some things to think about, that when you leave here, you might strike up a conversation with someone over coffee or with a family <coughs> member, or you might go to one of these, you might get on Google and search and read one of these um, articles or studies that I am talking about. So, um, for tonight, we're going to hear a little bit about occupational therapy because I can't not talk about it. <laughs> and this whole notion of occupation, what is that anyways? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how is health defined, um, as well as what determines health. Um, briefly explore whether our healthcare system actually leads to improved health. And then we're going to attempt to take, to use the concepts in occupational justice and sort of put on a pair of glasses and look through this lens and ask ourselves some more questions <coughs> about like, hmm, what would, if I put on this pair of glasses, what would that help me see in this dilemma of, of health care and ethics? And then just to consider our responsibility in the delivery of health care and health professions and health promotion. And again, this whole question of if just because we can, should we, or if we can, does it mean we should do it? So <clears throat> what my first job as an occupational therapist was working in community mental health. When I started OT, uh, in the OT program, I actually wanted to be an OT in the schools and I had no idea that occupational therapists work with people with mental illness. How many people knew OTs work with people with mental illness? Oh, so some. Hey, cool. This is great. Well, <laughs> you better know. <laughs> There's some OTs in the back there. Um, so, but I found, and, and I actually thought, I, so I wanted to work in the schools. And I even went at a moment was thinking about medicine. Maybe not OT. I don't know, you know. Um, and then I took a class that was about working with people with mental illness. And I was like, oh, and I had to do a field work experience. And I loved it. I loved it. Um, but, and then when I graduated, I was fortunate enough to actually to get a job working in a similar environment. So yay to Eastern for great education and preparing me to do that. Um, but where I worked, so I worked with people with severe and persistent mental illness. And they, um, they'd been dealing with this mental illness for a period of time. Some of them had even been in the institutional systems when we still, when they were quite pre prevalent here in the, the state of Michigan. Some people were actually just transitioning out when I started working with them from being in a hospital setting or an institutional setting for a long time. Um, they were coming to where I worked to find something meaningful to do, um, to find something to contribute, someone to relate to, a friend, maybe a relationship. Um, and they, I mean, we could all relate to that, right? Yeah, human, human desires or interests. Um, but they had a lot of barriers besides just having a, a chronic and persistent mental illness. They didn't have enough money. Um, they didn't have transportation. They, um, maybe they had housing, but it wasn't the housing they would like to have, or it was with a roommate that they didn't get to choose who that was, but it's because the agency was serving both people, and so that, that worked for, for them to live together. Um, they, they were taking really strong medications, potentially, and those had a whole series of side effects that in, uh, impacted their every day. Maybe they had a, a tremor, or maybe they drooled, or, uh, or maybe they, um, it affected their digestive system. All sorts of things that folks were dealing with. Um, and on my job, I was, I was evaluating them um, from what considered a psychosocial perspective, and trying to find out what was meaningful to them, how could the place that I worked help them begin to start to gain some confidence or some skills or experience and maybe go back to school, or things like that. And, and then you had to write up these treatment plans, right, because it was a billable service, you had to write up these treatment plans. And I did a lot of extra work on learning to be, have some expertise in person-centered planning. Um, and so I really knew how to be client-centered and 
person-centered, and we're going to make great goals, and they're going to be based on what you want to do. What do you think people's goals were? Does anybody? Huh? Be more independent. Be more independent. Sure. Okay, so be more independent. Um, have, a, you know, maybe it was to get a house. Maybe it was to get a job. Maybe it was, you know, some of these things that, you know, we all in here are, are hoping to be able to do when we graduate. Um, and so I'm writing my person-centered goals that are like to get a job and find housing and we're talking about all the steps that it takes to get there. And I was doing my job and, and I, and I was authentic and I, but then there came a moment where I thought, wait a second, maybe there's not even a housing available for them. Maybe there's not even the job that they really want. What's available is this other job that's, that's, you know, minimum wage job and well, maybe they don't have the skills to do what they really want. And of course I was thinking about that. I was coaching them along the way. But still there was this end product that I started to wonder, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. It's person-centered. It's what everybody's talking about. Everybody's getting trained in it. But is it really leading to um, participation in the way this person really uh, wants to participate. So you like bump up against this ethical dilemma. Hmm. And it's not because the person didn't want to, because they came every day. And it's not because I didn't want them to, because I was there and I was rooting for them. But it's because things outside the system, outside of the person, outside of my support of that person, they were factors that had to be considered. Um, As I've prepared for this lecture, uh, I, ha I have even more questions <laughs> than ever before. And I'm clear that I have a whole lot to learn <coughs> in this area and a whole lot more to learn to better understand the notion of occupational justice that we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, and I'm actually looking forward to it. Occupation, other than those OTs that are in the audience. <laughs> what, what, what do you think of when you hear occupation? Who knows what that means? Go ahead, somebody. A job. A job. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that. That's, you know, right? How many people, when you hear occupation, whoop, that comes in your mind, right? Yeah, okay, good, perfect. Yeah, when I first got my job, I would say, hey, OT lady, you gonna give me a job? <laughs> well, do you want one? <laughs> Let's start there. What do you know how to do? What are you interested in? <laughs> but, right, so an occupation. All right, anything else come to mind? Yay. Yeah, exactly. So when we think about our daily lives um, and what we choose to do every day or have to do every day or need to do every day uh, all day long, what now what are you thinking about? Yeah, sure, making yourself something to eat. How many people are parents in the room? Yeah, okay. So there's some things that you have to do around being a parent, right? Helping them to get dressed, making them breakfast, packing their lunch, things like that, breaking up fights, if you, <laughs> you know, right? How many people took a shower last night? Oh, okay, good. How many took one this morning? Okay, good. Hey, we have a whole everybody. How many, um, <laughs> how many took a bath instead of a shower? Anybody? No? Okay. Brushed your teeth? Cool. Drove a car? Okay, 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 good. So occupations. These are all occupations. So, an occupation. What we participate in throughout the day, right, gives meaning or structure to our day. There's a lot of times there's routines and habits developed around doing those. Anybody work out regularly? Yeah, yeah. So, occupation. Um, anybody that if you don't get to work out, whew, get out of your way. 
Yeah, a oh, couple. Yeah. <laughs> Some people are pointing at the people next to them. <laughs> An occupation place demands on performance. There's certain requirements in order to be able to, to do something, or, or maybe there's a need for a modification in order to be able to do it. It occurs within a context. Working out at the gym may be different than working out at home in front of the TV doing supper aerobics, right? <laughs> demands different things. Um, culturally based, and, and the occupation is an avenue for contri contributing. You know, just, that's one of the things I was struck by with the people I work with. A lot of times, they didn't have an avenue for contributing to society, giving back to their family. They often were just the recipients of service and um, had no means to give. It, occupations often occur with others, but they don't always. They're impacted by factors in and around us. Um, for example, snowy roads, <laughs> or um, policies, or reimbursement, what's, what's considered reimbursable, or you came to receive services and I, in order to receive services, you have to participate in a plan with me. <laughs> we've we've got to figure out what you want to work with. And, the, and they influence health. Um, a little question. So can an occupation negatively impact health? Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so anybody have an example that comes to mind? Yes. There's a lot of occupations that put a lot of wear and tear on the body, like if you're a construction worker. Oh, great. That's a great example. Vibration, noise, body structure, body position. Uh -huh. Working with, like, dangerous chemicals, like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of office job, fine motor with like arthritis, if you're a typer or like the model. Yeah, yeah. And what about like personal choices? Personal occupational choices, yeah. Um, if you choose to drink, smoke. Yeah, yeah. And so sometimes that leads to a, maybe a, a more positive or more negative health outcome <coughs> or condition. Sure. Um, so, as an OT, I believe that humans are occupational beings. Does that make sense? I mean, if you think about it, and you and you talk to someone on the phone, what's often the first thing you say? Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? And then what? <laughs> I, should, I meant the second thing you say. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? How was your day? Right? And then people tend to start to tell stories about their day, right? And often, if you're listening, you're listening, oh, that person does this and this and this and this and this, right? So does it also make sense that if humans are occupational beings and we have a need to engage, there is, you know, it's societal, it's cultural, we need to do and it's defined by society and culture and, and our personal values and things. But does it make sense to suggest that if there's a limit placed on that participation, that there would be some consequence or some un, you know, something happened that maybe um, isn't desirable? Does it make sense to say that? Yeah? Okay. All right, so now we, now we know a little bit more about an occupation, and we want to talk about health a little bit. So, who defines health? Yes. Isn't it culturally determined? It, so okay. Because different cultures determine what is, what is considered sick and what's not. Yeah, okay, great. So, <coughs> health it can be defined by your culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Government. Government can define it, sure. Define by Okay, good. So, yeah, so whether I feel like I need to go to the doctor or whether I need to work out or things like that, do, do I feel like that's going to benefit my health? Is that going to make me healthier? Mm -hmm. I would say the healthcare provider. Yeah, they might decide if you're healthy or not, right?
Okay. So individuals, culture, society, uh, policies, political dis discourse, um, genetics, right? All of those help define health. Uh, sometimes health is defined very explicitly and sometimes it's implicit, right? Uh, a lot of programs, of these healthcare programs, and their an outcome is improved health. So what the heck does that mean anyways? So as a, uh, someone who, my MPA degree, I, I did some uh, work with program evaluation, and um, that was one of the, the things, it was like, well, you've got to define what you mean by health in order to be able to measure whether or not you've actually achieved health. Um, so here's a, an explicit definition of health. This is the World Health Organization. Uh, they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So this definition suggests that health can happen despite illness or disease. Right? And it's not just about physical or mental capabilities or disabilities, it's, um, so in this we would say, this definition is not focused on just the medical model definition of health or illness, right? Or disease. Does anybody, everybody know what I mean by the medical model? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So the medical model, it is really, it really views disability as a feature of the person or as directly caused by the disease person has uh, amputation, the person um, has diabetes. And so then when we use that um, focus, then, that is so bright. <laughs> when we use a medical model focus, it would make sense that we would then focus our intervention on fixing what's wrong, right? Does that make sense? Fixing what's wrong. And correct the problem. But health is more than just the physical or mental um, breakdown, potentially, of the body. So what determines health? What makes you, he what makes you healthy? Yeah. Exercise. exercise, okay. Anybody else agree exercise makes you healthy? <coughs> yeah? Does exercise make anyone feel bad? In the bath. <laughs> what? You exercise way too much to damage your body. Okay, sure. So you could do it way too much. Yeah. Sometimes it can emphasize your lack of healthiness or your body and then you're all sore and you've really uh, done nothing. And, and you socially. Good. Really you're good. like, wow, I really maybe am unhealthy. Actually, I'm out of shape. I can't do this. Right? So sometimes exercise points out your um, where you're weak, potentially, right? What else? What else? Exercise, what else makes you healthy? What did you done? The people and individuals you surround yourself with. Ah, good. Your yeah. emotional and mental state. Yeah. So, can people relate to that? Yeah. Okay. So, people that you surround yourself with, they can lift you up, uh, they can commiserate, they could potentially in negatively influence you, uh, positively influence you, right? Anything else? So, so your individual choices like exercise or to drink or what you're going to eat or how much sleep are you going to get or whether you're going to stay up all night for that exam the next day, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> huh? Your genetic makeup, like what's Yeah, so your genetic makeup, great. The genes you can blame your mom and dad for or thank them for. <laughs> right, anything else? Okay. So, there's lots of different ways that this diagram is done, but this one was in uh, the PowerPoint, so I used <laughs> But um, looking at different ways to kind of categorize what we would call health determinants. What determines health? So there's the what we were born with, the genetics, right? The genetics, the biology, the color hair, are we male or female? Then there's our behavior. Um, or our, our choices, in OT we might talk about occupational choices, right? What we decide to do or not do, 
or aren't want to do but aren't able to do. All of that goes in here. Um, it's not always conscious either. It's not always a conscious choice. Um, and it's not just physically what we do. It also can be what we, you know, what we're thinking about as well. Um, local or family support, so the community around us, someone had said that one. Uh, living and working conditions can determine health, right? Think about people who worked in the coal mines or people that work in environments. Uh, what is, it, is it Google that's really, you know, working to have this really open and creative environment? Like, what does that environment um, do for the people that work in it versus you go to one where someone says, this is how it's done? Okay. And then the broader conditions and policies, healthcare policies, rules, regulations, you have to wear your seatbelt, all that kind of stuff, right? And what's important about this is, is that it, the, the determinants influence one another, so it's bi-directional, you know, or maybe it's not, maybe it's swirling. <laughs> it's probably more three-dimensional than bi-directional, where all of these are interacting with one another to influence health. Um, health. Um, and, and that not only are these all interacting with one another, they also um, are impacted across the life course. And they're impacted by decisions made before you were even born, potentially. For example, if you, um, there was a park in your neighborhood, and that park's been there for years, and you're just one block down on the same side of the street and you don't have to cross any streets and you have a young kid, that kid may be able to run down and that, and that park is safe and the neighborhood surrounding it is safe, that's going to be a green space for that kid to play in, right? Or if you're in a, a city where there's a lot of public transportation, you can get around and get to what you need to easier than in a, a more rural place. That, so are we, we're all following? All directions, all these factors, across the life course that influence health. So understanding what actually determines health is clearly extraordinarily complex. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people studying this, a lot of people grappling with the multitude of factors that play a role in determining health. Um, so next question, should healthcare keep us healthy? Ooh, there's some oohs. Yeah. No, if we should keep ourselves healthy. Okay. If an emergency happens, then we should depend on healthcare. Okay. So that's one. Anybody have a different idea? I think healthcare should be there for support, but when it comes down to it, like they should be the avenues that you can use to become healthy, but then the end of each your decision. Okay. Okay. I think this depends on perspective because. Healthcare wouldn't exist if everyone was healthy. So this is where ethics comes in. Should they really keep us healthy? Okay. Well, no, because then they wouldn't exist. And there would be no healthcare system because there would okay. be no need for it. So you're sort of getting at like, is there a, an incentive? Is, is there something that, you know, we sort of keep ourselves employed? Is it, okay, yeah, yeah. It definitely shouldn't make us unhealthy. Okay, <laughs> so you know what, it's really, that's a really great point. And sometimes when we're grappling with big things, it, sometimes we start by identifying well, what it shouldn't do. <laughs> so it shouldn't make us unhealthy. Okay, anybody else have any other there shouldn'ts? No? Yeah. I don't think it should like limit the choices that you can make. Like, it shouldn't tell you this is what you need to do. Okay. Maybe suggest that. Okay. Anybody else? I would just say I would love some of my health care dollars to go to pay for my yoga class as opposed to injections uh -huh. or, you know, arthritis medicines later on because they didn't take the yoga class. Did you hear that? What she said was, well, I'd sure like to see some of my health care dollars that I'm spending um, and that are being spent on me to um, contribute to pay for my yoga class. That if I, you know, stick with it, it's going to actually possibly 
reduce on the arthritis or any of the treatment, more expensive treatments that I'm going to need down the road. Okay. That. Yeah. Okay, so, so if, if it, if it, if it, I'm going to go with that line of thinking. If it kept us healthy, what else would it include? So maybe some prevention is what I hear you talking about. Anybody else have some ideas of, of what it might include? Teaching us how to cook better. Okay. So maybe learning healthier eating habits. I like this notion. We're going to explore this further. <clears throat> so, does our healthcare system actually lead to improved health? How many, just real quick, how many say yes? Our healthcare system leads to improved health. Huh? Okay. No? Okay, so let's, okay, we'll do a thumbs up if you think yes, a thumbs down if it's no, and a eh, 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 eh. Yeah, okay, so we got a lot of eh, eh, we got some thumbs down. Yeah, this is a mixed, a mixed group. Um, <laughs> um, if we go with the definition of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmary, does anybody change their mind about that? Does our healthcare system keep us healthy? Oh, did we get, did anybody go from here to, <laughs> so a lot of people were like, oh wait, thumbs down, now that we're thinking about the big definition of health. Um, so I want to share a study. I was very fortunate. I was, I was already thinking about this because I, I teach an introduction to healthcare careers class, um, and at the beginning of the class, I bring in a, a lot of different lecturers to, to talk, and David Clifford, who I would mentioned, had come in, and he does this lecture on paying for health care. And the first time I heard it, I sat in the back of the class with trying to like keep my mouth shut. Mm. <laughs> because what he said about um, challenging sort of how our health care system, is it, are we getting what we pay for, is his question. That really... Um, got me thinking. And so when this opportunity to speak at this, I was like, I'm, I'm going to talk to him about that. I'm going to look at some of the resources he suggested, and I'm going to bring that into this presentation because I think it's really important. But I was really lucky because in January of 2013, the Institute of Medicine um, issued a report, a huge report, that is available for free download, and um, I'll tell you where to get that. And if anyone can see it on here, this is where you can get it. And the title is called The U.S. Health and International Perspectives. They took these experts from all different disciplines, all different um, institutions, also some international folks, and they poured over the literature. Um, research that was out there, looked at data, looked at data in different ways. Apparently they had graduate assistants that were working with them so that they could um, analyze data that had been out there but not analyzed in a particular way. And what they did was, they compared the United States to 16 other peer countries. Peer countries were defined as other um, wealthy nations. Okay? And the question was, is there a United States health disadvantage across the lifespan? And if so, why? Um, let me tell you some of the countries. Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Norway, <coughs> Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom, okay? So before I tell you what they found, I just want to ask you a quick question. How much are we spending um, per person on healthcare in the United States? Does anybody know? So per capita, per, per person. Does anybody have a guess? Who is we? The United States. Thanks. In one, year. in one year, mm -hmm. in a given year, how much are we spending on people? Five thousand. Five thousand. Okay. Anybody think higher? Anybody think lower per person? Remember, we have three hundred and twelve point eight million people in the United States. Okay. So here you go. 
In comparison to these seven, 16 other countries in 2010, this is how much the United States is spending per person on health care as compared to these other 17 countries. Um, the dollar amount is uh, $8,233 per person, so times 312.8 million people um, on health care. Is anybody surprised by that? No. Huh? Yeah? yeah? What did you think it was going to be? I thought it would be a whole lot lower than that. A whole lot lower. What's included in that? That is a great question. I think it's all, um, all spending on health care, um, all health care dollars. But I mean, is that, is that like hospital care or doctor's care or does it, any wellness care get included in that? that? The wellness piece, I don't know. But yes, it's, it's medical procedures, it's doctor's visits, it's all of that. So if you look at, for example, Portugal, Portugal spends, um, Oh, what's on my two $2,728 a person. So if we, let's say we had about 100 people in this, this room, um, in a year we would spend $823,300 for all of us in this room to have health, well, for all, for all of us, if we counted all of us. Now, does that mean that we're all, we all would be covered? No. Okay, or we could cruise on over to Portugal, and we could they we would spend two thousand seven hundred. I'm sorry, two hundred seventy-two thousand eight hundred dollars to insure all of us, right? And we would all be covered by health care. Um, but if we spent what we'd spent in the United States, we could have covered three hundred and two more people, right? It starts to add up. So we're spending more than any of these other 17 countries or 16 countries. Are we healthier? <laughs> it was a low moment. <laughs> mm, it's that mm, our crisis is showing. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't just put that in there. <laughs> so what the report found is actually we have shorter lives, poorer health in um, many of the health indicators that you might use. Um, adverse birth outcomes, so we have higher, let's see here. We have um, the highest infant mortality rate of any of those countries. Um, and also rank almost the lowest as far as birth weight. American children are less likely to live to age five than children in these other countries. Um, more deaths from motor vehicle crashes. Violence occurs at much higher rates in the United States. Um, more, the, let's see, the highest rate of pregnancies and more likely to acquire sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, second highest prevalence of HIV and the highest incident of, of AIDS. Um, Americans lose more years of life to alcohol and drugs than in these other countries. Uh, highest obesity rate. Um, we kind of, that one maybe people knew a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. But did you know that this starts, this obesity rate starts in childhood and then it just persists throughout the rest of life? Um, the death rate from ischemic heart disease is the second highest among the countries. Um, I mean, on and on and on, right? So the key point here is we are behind. And something that struck me about this report and that they really strive to point out is that this is not um, income dependent. This is not a socioeconomic factor. They compared across income levels, across educational levels, whether you had health care or not. And it, so you could take, um, you could have a, a good job, have a college degree, um, have health insurance, on and on, and you're going to still fare worse than someone in that comparable category in one of these other countries. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I think one interesting thing with the snapshot they gave of countries is 
outside of possibly Australia, where they, we have a very different legal system than the rest of those countries, um, which drives our health care costs higher. Not necessarily better, but higher. Those yeah. other countries, there's no malpractice, there's no suing doctors. Right, okay. So I wonder if that's taken into consideration. <coughs> yes. This report, um, whew, it's hefty to get through, but you might enjoy reading it. Um, it really, it really speaks to all the different factors that influence the way the decisions get made. And um, yes, actually, Becky and I were talking on the phone uh, yesterday about um, I'd found a, some information about the United Nations has a Bill of Rights, and the United States um, Congress in December voted down signing on to it, even though there's like something like 127 other countries and. The, um, and when you read it, you think, why? Why wouldn't we sign on to that? Um, and Becky said she'd heard a, a conversation, a, a report about it, and that they'd actually said, in part, it was because of the legal system. You know, could we be sued then because we're not currently providing that? And it's a lot of our policies and our social structure aren't set up to do that. Yeah, it's a great point. In the back, yeah. And part of it is they have to revamp taxes because in countries that have national health care, their taxes go to it. Right. And you can buy additional insurance, but even visitors to the country have access to health care mm -hmm. through the national system. My friend was studying abroad in Japan, was able to go see a doctor, get a translator, and all she did was pay for her medication. Yeah. And that's something that I think that we all would benefit from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, every t even now, standing up here saying this, every time I talk about this or think about it, I just am like, oh, how is this possible? This is, it, it, I don't know, there's a part of me that's real angry about it. Yeah. I think the culture is also really different. The U.S. has a extravagant, indulgent culture. We always want more, we want it bigger, you know, our homes are bigger, or everything is big now, you know. And I think in Europe, the culture is ex extremely different, and I think that's really reflected that it's like, also, if there's a government piece, and then there's a people choice piece that, yeah. like, we don't need plates that are this yeah. big, and that tends to, you know, hang on the wasteland. So, I think we have to take some personal responsibility, too, just as a culture yeah. of just being overindulgent. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. I, I appreciate that comparison, but there are even really poor countries, such as the country I come from, Uruguay, that has. Uh, universal health coverage for all its citizens uh, and residents. And, and that is something important, you know, how a country makes a decision on how to spend their wealth has a lot to do with what we get in the end as well. So this being a very, very wealthy country, you know, how are we spending the money is something to think about. Uh, because is it really that we don't have the money to cover, you know, health for all our citizens, or is it that the money is going, uh, you know, it is spent in, in a different um, way? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great point. My public, I, I had to take a couple of public budgeting classes, and has anybody taken a class from Joe Oren? Yeah, no, right. Um, but he uh, he talks a lot about how your budget reflects either. Um, explicitly or not, <laughs> what the priorities are, or what the current um, in political environment is, what the current structures, and it also reflects the, this is what we've always done, and we just keep on doing. <laughs> See, what we think is personal responsibility, responsibility of the individual, right. uh, rather than uh, social responsibility, it's yeah. responsibility of all of us. Right, and you heard that, and you hear that in some of the comments that people have made is that people have different ideas about this. Well, uh, you know, should healthcare keep us healthy? Well, um, it's an individual choice. It should be a support for us versus, uh, no, it, it isn't just an individual. It is a societal um, structure and support that, if there, demonstrates better health outcomes. Yeah, you had a comment. Yeah, I was going to say also we have different infrastructure that's set up. You know, in the Midwest, you, it's not uncommon to drive half an hour or an hour to commute to your workplace and you travel somewhere to, you know, you travel to the next town over, you don't walk there. Right. Um, things that are things that um, promote health, uh, maybe we don't have access to, they're not near us. Um, also, our food system. <coughs> 
you know, we subsidize crops that don't promote health. Hmm. We subsidize crops that go towards fast food and things like that. Yeah. Okay. So we're already talking about the why. Why is why is this happening? And this report does not um, say for sure. But just like what we're doing here, they raise lots of questions, and they they are they are pointing at multiple factors um, and health systems are one of, is one of them, right? We have a large uninsured um, population, limited access to um, primary care. Um, it's often unaffordable. Uh, we um, there are, there's this organization called the, um, the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperative Development, and there's 28 states or um, nations that are on a part of this organization, and they have a report that said that um, Mexico, Turkey, and the United States are the only of the 28 countries that do not get close to universal health care insurance. Health behaviors, so we've been talking about this a little bit. Good news, we as a nation smoke and drink less than these other, these other countries. But, <laughs> so we die younger? Huh? But we die younger? Yep, yeah. right, okay, right. So it raises more questions. But we consume more calories, we have a higher rate of drug abuse, we don't wear seatbelts, and we're more likely to use firearms and acts of violence. Remember, just compared to these other wealthy nations that were up here. Um, <laughs> social and economic conditions. More good news. Um, we have this higher than average income. Yeah? But higher levels of poverty, especially with children. Mm -hmm. there's a, and we have, there's a bigger gap between, um, you know, those with higher incomes and those with lower incomes. The rich and the poor. Yeah, the rich and the poor. Um, lower educational outcomes as well. The physical environment, which is what you were speaking about. So that built environment or um, access to transportation. When we think about occupations that might promote health, um, uh, you know, occupations that are possible or desirable or required in a country where, you know, it's impossible to get your car into the town and find a place to park, you know. So, um, so the physical environment definitely has an influence on health. Also, you know, pollution control and those kind of things. Public policies, we've been talking a lot about that. Public policies, as we have said, it's often reflect the larger social values. And um, they actually looked at research that suggested, so there's a, a couple of different models that they were talking about. There's the social democratic model, which the fo focuses on social equality um, of, of government. And then, like the Scandinavian countries, it sounds like your country. Um, and then what they call an Anglo-Saxon or a more liberal model, which is what you see like in the United States and the UK. And when you look at the um, research, it shows that those with the social democratic model have, have higher, um, better health outcomes than um, those with the more Anglo-Saxon liberal model. So it, that suggests that it isn't just about individual choice. Um, you know, in Sweden, your college is paid for. You're, you have health care. Uh, you get five weeks paid vacation. You uh, 16 months paid leave for new parents. Everyone pays more. But um, I was reading an article that said that people believe that it helps ensure that certain aspects of their health is stable, regardless of whether you know, a job plant moves to another country or the job closes or the market demand changes and so suddenly or you get ill and cannot work. And so it's some of the trade-offs um, that we have to grapple with as we start to try to figure out what to do that we are behind as a nation. What are we going to do? 
There's a unnatural causes. You can get it through the library. There's a series, um, and uh, actually they're going to be showing it at the Ann Arbor Library one of these days. I can't remember when it's coming out in the next week or so. But it's called Unnatural Causes. And they are really looking at this whole idea, does, does um, poverty make us sick? Does inequality make us sick? <clears throat> and um, in one of them, there's a, this, an Electrolux plant, Electrolux plant that was in Michigan. They also had a plant in Sweden. And they closed, and they followed the lives of people there. And the difference between the health outcomes of these two groups of people was extraordinary. Um, you know, in Sweden, they went back to school, got an education, had, took some time to kind of figure out what they needed to do. Or what percent? Meanwhile, uh, uh, because here, if you if you lose your job, oh, yes. you get I don't know half the money or whatever. Right. You, you Is there unemployment? They said eighty percent in Sweden. Yeah, you get unemployment at eighty percent. So differences. Uh, you know, could we actually take what Sweden does and throw it over in the United States and say that that's going to work? Nope. But there's, as a nation, to be, um, and as the people sitting in this room, whatever area of practice or whatever discipline you're in, to be grappling with, what do we do about this? We can't just say, well, let's do what Sweden does, because we're not Sweden. But what could we learn from them? So, now what are we going to do with all this information, right? <laughs> Just to change the <coughs> Your insurance doesn't cover the sniffles. Come back when it develops into something more serious. <laughs> I, think, I think this report, for me anyways, resonated as something more serious than I was aware that it was. That, that it was. Um, and that we've got to move beyond the medical model. Um, how, and how I practice as an OT, I've got to really be thinking about that. Um, how I assess performance, how I assess participation. It, it's not enough just to say, well, I'm working with this individual person and I'm, and I'm seeing them make some gains. I've got to be thinking, thinking bigger. Um, and it's not just about what OTs talking to OTs, it's about all disciplines talking, disciplines talking to one another. I had this, so I went on this, you know, come off the cartoon. I didn't have a place for all of them, but this one I felt was very rel relevant. So, can everyone see what's going on here? <laughs> the doc's looking through the insurance company's ears, who's looking into the guy's ears, and he says, Doc, can you see the problem? And the doc says, I'm afraid so. What's the problem? Don't you? So, now, and I'm not here, I'm not, to just be clear, I'm not standing here saying the insurance company, that's the problem. It's the piece of the problem, like the built environment, like the policies, like the culture, like the, but what I like about this is the doctor is looking through a lens that's defining the problem, looking through a lens that defines health or illness or what, what is, what is what's, covered, what is not what covered. Is covered and what is not covered as an individual practitioner. That, this was relevant to me because I thought, oh yeah, you know, reimbursement determines what I'm going to do with that person, how many billable units that person, how much time I'm going to spend with them. Whether that's what they really need or not, that's the system right now. So does the, going back to the question of the series, does the lens we look through limit what we can do? Absolutely. It doesn't prevent us from seeing what we should do. Yeah. Um, this is a sidebar, but I'm in education. I'm in special education. Okay. And it's a very similar issue where we see kids that need support. They need help. They're struggling. Mm -hmm. But I'm by law or like by federal money, I'm only allowed to do this much. And right. oh, yeah, you're a grade level below in reading, but you're not that far. And so you have to go shift it into something else and not get as much support. Yeah. So there's that ethic of like, how much can I help you? And then that lets you. And then I feel like, you probably do it in healthcare too, like I feel constrained mm -hmm. by like what I'm supposed to do or what I'm covered to do or built, but then there's things I would like to do. Yes. And it's just like the system kind of can find you. Right. And, and it's hard to, to imagine how would we even start up and 
and provide that service if it wasn't paid for. I've seen services, I've heard stories about services that they start things up and it's a great idea and then the funding runs out and they're like, okay, how are we going to make this billable? And suddenly you start, the dialogue changes. And now the services that were so great that they were offering when they had the freedom to not be billable have shifted and they're going to have different outcomes for the people that have been participating. I mean, it's important to control costs. Clearly, we're spending too much. But are we spending it in the right spots? Um, so I just wanted to share this. This actually comes from the preamble to the ALT <coughs> Code of Ethics. And I really liked it, so that's why I put it in here. That it's not just about ethics and ethical principles, it's but it's about ethical action. Actually take doing something with what it is that you know or that you're seeing. And they say it's a manifestation of moral character and mindful reflection, a commitment to benefit others, to virtuous practice of artistry and science, which I thought was really beautiful, um, to genuinely good behaviors and to noble acts of courage. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this really complex problem that we're talking about here, um, that noble acts of courage, <laughs> Sometimes having that tough conversation, um, sometimes pushing back at the system that says you can't provide that for them because it's not billable. Um, you know, challenging the status quo. Um, actually, uh, Jane and I have talked a lot about this this notion of occupation-based practice, and that in some settings, so that that what that means is that you're using um, what's meaningful to the person, um, or as close to what's meaningful to the person, both um, as a way of getting them towards where they want to be, and then actually getting to participate in something that's meaningful all at the same time, right? Versus some something like um, stacking cones or pegs, or which have a have a place, but sometimes that's where we end therapy instead of moving beyond that. And um, one of the things that, that comes up for our students is, well, I want to do it differently, but it's not what's being done in the setting. And I'm just a student. And so how do we support students in taking on you know, these noble acts of courage to say it can be done differently. Um, it's not going to look the same, um, but it might take different resources. And uh, you know, I don't know. And it might not be as profitable. Less profitable. Uh, yes, and then we get to the the legal issues and the malpractice that you were talking about, back, right? So, occupational justice. Um, so, ethical questions about healthcare and our current model of service delivery can be really overwhelming. At least they feel, it feels overwhelming to me. Complex. Where do you start? What do you do? Um, I think it's so complex that sometimes people just do this. <laughs> I, I don't even know what to, I'm not going to deal with it. I, how can one be make a difference? Um, um, I think many people feel hopeless in that. There's, how are we going to change the, the culture of the American people <laughs> to look more like Sweden or <laughs> something like that, right? Um, and yet the biggest recommendation from this study that I, or this report I've been telling you about is that the American people need to know about this. People don't know about this. They don't know. They might know about obesity. They might know about pieces of it, but they don't know, like in all of these different areas, we are nearly dead last compared to these other countries. We're at a health disadvantage. Um, so we've got to act, and that's that ethical action that I was talking about. So I, I'm finding hope in the reading that I've been doing and preparing for this in occupational justice. I think there's a lot of dialogue that's happened. And what's funny is if someone would have asked me this a little while ago and said, occupational justice, social justice, well, I would have been like, eh. Occupational justice is actually in a part of social justice. And I, you know, um, and I don't know why we're trying to distinguish ourselves that way. But as I've read about it, I see it actually very complementary 
to the notion of occupation or of social justice. And, um, and it's a powerful language because if we do believe that humans are occupational beings, and there are many places that people are not able to participate in the way that they want, desire, um, or have a right to, then, then there is a dialogue here to be had. I also felt, have found that this occupational justice uh, framework helps me to evaluate from an ethical perspective. Am I, um, is my practice ethical in terms of these standards? Not just the, yeah, I'm getting paid for it, sure. Um, but is it what I should be doing? So a little bit about occupational justice. The first one you've heard me say a couple times. Uh, occupational justice enables and empowers people and populations to participate in the everyday occupations of society. So there's a couple of um, theories <coughs> in occupational therapy and occupational science. Um, Ann Wilcock and Elizabeth Townsend, they began dialoguing. They, they had, their research was, um, was related but different and they began dialoguing many years ago. And they realized that they had this shared vision of a world where um, public and social policies and initiatives included and empowered people to participate in what it was that they really desired to do or contribute in a way that felt good to them. Um, they believed that as occupational therapy practitioners and as any healthcare practitioners, we needed to um, have a health advocacy movement. <laughs> um, if I was Arlo Guthrie, I'd like make a song about it or something. Health advocacy movement that focused on removing these barriers to individual and population uh, participation. Does everyone know who Arlo Guthrie is or did I just talk over? <laughs> Sorry, I'm aging myself. <laughs> he wrote a really awesome song, Alice's Restaurant, political songwriter. Yeah, okay. Anyway. You'll listen to it at Thanksgiving, apparently. Um, so, um, but they really want us to focus on not just individuals, but populations. That, that were being, that they were experiencing barriers to uh, participation, right? Um, and so I think that that's key in here, po people and populations. It also shifts the focus from disease, right, the medical model, to one of participation that's applicable. You don't have to have a disease for us to be talking about, well, you don't have to have an illness, something doesn't have to be wrong. Specifically, um, and then occupational justice, the lack or the lack thereof, is influenced just like we've been talking about these structural and contextual factors. And then they identified three different occupational outcomes: occupational rights, which is the ideal, um, dis-ease, which I kind of like that hyphen in there. I think it's great, um, and then injustices. a little bit about occupational rights. What are people, does anybody have any questions? You should feel free to ask. Okay, we have more, we have more dialogue coming up. So, occupational rights. This, they admitted this is the ideal. But if we don't sort of identify what the ideal looks like, then we can't talk about whether or not it's happening, right? Um, so, if we all had our occupational rights were all being supported, we would experience our day-to-day -day life, the things we wanted to do as meaningful. Um, we, would, we would recognize that participation in the things that were meaningful to us was actually an avenue for health and for social inclusion. We would understand that autonomy in both the little decisions and the big picture decisions, uh, I'm sorry, autonomy, <laughs> Backup. That choice <laughs> and having some control and some um, influence over the little things that happen in your life as well as the big things, that that leads to autonomy. And we would understand that there needs to be a balance. 
that there has to be a variety that's available for people, right? And I, I thought, oh, I, I want to start thinking about some of the experience that I've had in the past. Um, and then as I move forward in my experience as a practitioner, well, how am I doing with that? When I think about individual people, or am I considering populations? That I, I can honestly say uh, no in, in some ways. Yeah, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. But I, I'm not sure. There's a lot of room for me to grow in, in this framework as a practitioner. So when rights are impacted or denied, there are some other outcomes. Um, this notion of dis-ease. Um, which, I think this last one, social disintegration, is one I really want to talk about the most on here. Because that's related to, this, to educational systems, systems breaking down, right? Educational systems, health systems, political systems. And I would say that this report that came out suggests that there's, we're having a breakdown <laughs> in terms of health, in terms of our nation's health as related to other, these other countries. Um, and that what we're doing is becoming ineffective and really need to start to figure out what to do about it. And then I just wanted to compare the difference between occupational rights that we talked about and then what they identify are occupational injustices. So, um, so occupational alienation contrasted with experiencing meaning and enrichment is this notion of that you you lack experience in you lack I'm sorry you lack meaning in your daily experiences that your you feel that what you do in daily life or aspects of it are meaningless you feel disconnected and it's not and I mean this can be an individual but it's also thinking about populations that are disconnected from their communities. Can anybody think of a population that might be disconnected from the community? Disconnected from opportunities, disconnected from, <coughs> that may feel they have nothing to contribute. Yeah? Well, I work pretty heavily in the specialized community, and I think in all severity types, there's moments where I talk to kids and they feel like they don't do anything, they like can't contribute or they don't have control. Like, these adults just always tell me what to do when I don't, you know, and I don't, my thoughts don't like of it or that their tasks like they could be more meaningful but they end up just being repetitious and kind of obscure mm -hmm. because we're so focused on the skill and not necessarily like their meaning right like, associated with it it's like oh we want you to find motors you're gonna string beads but he's a 13 year old boy and has no desire to make a necklace and so it's just that like, <laughs> that contrast sure sure okay it's a great example uh, one of the, the things that I was thinking about with this was, um, just from my own experiences, was that um, the adults with developmental disabilities, and they get out of the school systems, and then what do they do? They, in the schools, at least they you know, had sort of the routine of school. And so there's day programs. Does anybody know what happens at some of the day programs? Some of them are amazing. Yeah, what happens? Um, I go to and I have a nice one here every day have a uh, program that comes in sometimes and they just kind of, they kind of do things, they help clean up, they watch skating and stuff, and they just mm -hmm. kind of, well, you can see some of the therapists or the teachers um, like doing tasks with them sometimes. It's like very interesting to watch. Sometimes they'll be like um, doing puzzles or stringing beads or something. Right, okay. to participate, right? How to get where they need to go. They're being given access, right? So, um, if, but if what you have to do every day isn't stimulating, <coughs> isn't meaningful, and it's the only choice that you have, um, 
then then we're talking about occupational alienation. Occupational deprivation is when your participation is limited um, as a result of forces outside of the individual or population's, you know, or the person's control, you know. Um, such as you will, it's not safe to go out in your neighborhood, so you're not gonna you're not gonna have a lot of outside time exploring and sort of that free, maybe adventure or things that maybe adolescents need, right? Um, um, because if you do, you could get hurt or um, get killed, you know, something terrible like that, or getting yourself into a lot of trouble. Or you'd like to, okay, you'd like to swim, but uh, there's no, no pool, and so in your neighborhood, or fresh groceries. You love to cook, but you live in a place with an apartment, and they say you can't use a stove because your roommate is um, unsafe, and so, right? So, right, you can kind of start to think about this. Um, marginalization, honestly, this is one that I'm really um, struggling to understand. I feel like I can understand the extreme version of it, <laughs> but um, where it actually looks like um, discrimination, but not some of the more subtle ways, and, and the writings about this suggest that it's su subtle, so it's something that I'm continuing to think about and explore, but it's the notion of there's this sort of, in, in a setting, in the, uh, in the classroom, in the grocery store, in the library, in a uh, culture, that there's a set of rules um, that are either explicit or implicit, um, that it's kind of like how you participate, or when is okay to participate, or where that participation happens. And so, um, occupational marginalization occurs potentially when, um, when there is, you know, a person can't follow the rules, so to speak. And then imbalance, just you can overwork. There are those who don't have anything to do and those who have way too much on their plate. So there's, and this isn't about income or, or wealth or, or anything. Um, so these concepts help us then to think about, um, and I know I only have a couple more minutes, so we're gonna try to wrap this up. But how, to help to begin to think about how does occupational justice help us think about ethics in healthcare then, as a society or a practitioner? Anybody have any thoughts on that? What is it starting to make you think about? Wonderful question. What, what, what would they like to do? Should we be giving that to them? How much would that cost? Yeah. Um, people who cannot make their own decisions, so like whether you have a disability or perhaps you're not in the right mind, having someone mm -hmm. else in charge of you and basically dictating how things will happen, what procedures, you will have what medication. Right. Right. And thinking about some of our, um, what, you know, our loved ones as they age, or as we age, or someone with a progressive condition that um, is going to eventually lose their ability to talk. Yeah. And, and use their voice. Yeah. So maybe how can we address things like occupational deprivation or alienation as a different way to prevent uh, negative health outcomes. So mm -hmm. use it as preventative medicine. Exactly. Yeah, that's, I got excited about that. I did, I did too, so I'm glad you heard that. I, um, and the, the, this, this is, I am an OT, and so occupation and occupational justice, and, but this isn't just an OT conversation. This is a, this is a, 
bigger conversation in it. And it's a framework to think about that maybe we haven't thought about yet. Yeah. All right, so I had a few more questions, and um, but I've got what, about five minutes, three minutes? One, two minutes? Okay. So just with the person next to you, pick, pick one of these questions. Is there recovery without meaning? Uh, these are questions I've been thinking about, so I thought I'd share them. Is there recovery without meaning? Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm getting, I'm making some tree have, rehab goals, but what I'm doing isn't meaningful. Is there recovery without meaning? Um, is there a cost to not addressing meaning? So take one of these and just talk with the person next to you about one of, just, just, just share your thoughts about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your listening.